Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Claire from Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and I'm the coordinator of our Tackling Plastic NI project. And this project is funded by the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. This is the fourth in our short series of our Tackling Plastic webinars for EcoSkills Northern Ireland, which is run by Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. Today, I'm so delighted to have Dr. Tara Shine with us. She's an expert in the field of climate change and climate justice with a passion for communicating her science and her positive vision for the future. Today, Tara is going to unpack the life cycle of everyday objects and equip you with actions you can take to live more sustainably, one step at a time. By the end of the webinar, we hope you'll feel even more empowered to take eco action to reduce your use of pointless plastic in school and at home. So before I hand over to Tara, I'd just like to introduce you to my colleague and co-host for the day, Francesca. Hi everyone, I'm Francesca. I'm the Eco Schools Project Officer and Young Reporters for the Environment National Operator Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful. Today I'm going to keep an eye on the chat, so a bit of housekeeping, and you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen a little chat box. You can leave your comments there throughout the webinar, and there is also a Q&A box, so we want to encourage you to add your questions there, and then at the end of this webinar we will have more or less 10 minutes dedicated to that with Tara answering to your interesting question. So thank you very much and over to you Tara. Thank you Claire and thank you Francesca and hi everybody. It's really nice to be with you all this afternoon. Hope you had a good day in school. Hope you didn't get too much homework. Um, or maybe if this is your homework, hopefully it isn't going to be too difficult just sitting watching me and maybe we can have some fun. So what I want to do is I'm going to share my screen with you because I've prepared a little presentation with like images and things for you guys to look at. Um, and I really look forward to any questions you have. If you're wondering anything as you go, just put that in the chat box and Francesca will let me know and I'll be able to reply to you. So now I'm just going through the process of sharing my screen with you and share the sound with you. Here we go. Um, so I am mad passionate about helping people to save their own planet. And I think this is really important. The planet doesn't exist uh, just as a separate entity to us. We're part of the planet. We live on this planet Earth and we need to look after it um, for ourselves because we can't live without the food and the water and the air that our planet provides us. So if we keep messing things up, the planet will probably be fine. Um, it'll be us, the human beings, that won't be fine. And we don't want to become the next dinosaurs. So that's why all of this is, is important to think about. Um, so I studied um, up in Northern Ireland, where most of you are watching from. Um, I studied up there for, for years for my degree and for my, for my um, PhD. But now I live down in Kinsale, right down the bottom of Ireland. But you'd be pleased to know we face the same challenge as about with pointless plastic and single-use plastics down here as you do up in Northern Ireland. It's the exact same problems. So what we want to look at is the power you have as a, as a student in your own community, um, in being an ambassador for helping people to go plastic free through the choices and changes you make in your home, um, through the voice that you use and the experiences that you share with other people when you meet them by telling people what you're doing and how it makes your life better. That's a really powerful way that you can get others to follow the lead that you set. So what I thought might be fun is to tell you a little bit about how I have ended up doing what I do. So I'm an environmental scientist. I went to, that's what I went to college and studied in Coleraine in Northern Ireland. Um, but obviously before I was an environmental scientist, I was something else. Uh, so first of all, I had to go to school like you guys. And back in the 1970s, this is what school girls look like. Um, so I am the one, uh, second one in with pigtails and a funny kind of rusty brown colored pinafore thing. That is me, aged eight. And that was around the time that I started to get really curious around my natural world. I was lucky I had a a granny who, whenever she took me for walks, was always pointing out the different plants that were growing in the hedgerows and telling me what was what, um, helping me to pick blackberries and learn how to cook with them. 
teaching me how to peel apples that we would find. Um, so she taught me a lot. And then my dad was a geography teacher. So he was another great source of inspiration. And he was always taking us on Sunday drives and telling us what I thought was the most boring facts about the geography of the places we would drive around and visit and how the mountains had formed and why the river was flowing that way. And, um, but clearly it had an impact and I must have listened a little bit. Um, because then when I went on to go to secondary school, where I'm now in the middle with the really short hair looking a little bit like a boy, uh, when I went to secondary school, what I found out was that really I was really interested in the environment. This was something that was really important to me. And I helped to set up our, for our school's first green club, um, our green committee to try in that stage and get people to learn more about recycling. Because believe it or not, back in Ireland in the 1980s, we were only starting to learn how to recycle things and how to separate our waste, something we're much, much better at nowadays. And it's a whole lot easier because we have the right bins to put things in. Back then it was all really, really right at the beginning. And after, you know, after school, I thought, oh, what will I do now? And I found out about environmental science. That was a really new subject in, at that time. In fact, the only place in Ireland you could study environmental science in 1989 was in Coleraine. So that's how I ended up going to Coleraine. Um, and I studied environmental science there for years and it, it was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And it led me to have loads of adventures, particularly in Africa, um, and included me living in that country there that is colored in in orange on the map that country is called mauritania it's huge it's two and a half times the size of france and nobody has ever heard of it i had never heard of it it's kind of squeezed in there between morocco and senegal three quarters of mauritania is is desert sahara desert it was the hottest place i have ever lived in my life in the month of may the temperatures get up to 50 degrees celsius it's like having a hair dryer on hot blowing in your face the entire time and what I learned, or I learned many things in Mauritania about very different customs and way of living to mine, but I also learned to ask questions and to be curious, but also to be humble and know what I don't know. Um, and sometimes when, you know, you're the person who's been brought in to work with the community as the expert and they tell you things that sound completely unbelievable, it's really hard to be humble and admit that you don't know. But the local people in Mauritania told me that there were crocodiles and um, that they would see crossing their fields at night. And I thought they were very mixed up and they had got crocodiles and big lizards mixed up. But um, they were right. Um, and so I spent a long time then studying these wonderful crocodiles in these tiny, tiny wetlands and in the back of caves and the strangest places that they lived in Mauritania where they had adapted to living in very, very dry and in a spot, inhospitable places. But this curiosity I have about the natural world is a really important thing and has been important right up to now in the world that I work that I do and in writing uh, the book, How to Save Your Planet, One Object at a Time that I wrote last year. Because if we're not curious, if we don't ask questions about where things come from or why is that, or even why is that just so cheap or why has everybody not got one of those? Um, if we don't ask these questions, then we can't use our inquiring scientific minds to find the answers. So a, a sense of curiosity is a really important thing to have. Um, after all that fun running around in deserts and wetlands, I ended up working for another, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so um, at the international level with the United Nations and with Mary Robinson, who's the former uh, president of Ireland, Ireland's first female president. Um, working on, on climate change policy, creating um, the international law that determines what all countries have to do about climate change. So I used to go to UN climate change conferences all around the world. My carbon footprint from flying is terrible. So I'm really liking COVID and not having to fly places. Um, and that was really interesting to me because it was around creating laws that bound all kinds of countries, all countries around the world. In the negotiations there, every single country from the biggest to the smallest was represented. Every single one of them had a voice. And at those meetings, our job was to decide, to decide what the world together um, had to do to reduce the dangers caused by global warming, what we would do to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, what we would do to protect the countries that were being already be really badly hit by floods and cyclones, how we would collectively 
protect them and look after them, especially as many of those countries that were experiencing the biggest floods and the biggest storms hadn't even contributed much of the greenhouse gases that were causing climate change. And finding fair answers to climate change when really climate change is very unfair in that, you know, possibly a person living in Malawi that owns a bicycle and not a car and lives in a small house, not a big house, and that doesn't have any electricity, they're, they're using hardly any carbon in their life. They're not using fossil fuels. They're not producing pollution yet. Um, their country is already suffering the worst impacts of climate change. And that fact that that's unfair, that really annoys me. And because that really annoys me, I use that to hopefully power me to get up out of bed every morning and work hard to find solutions to climate change that are fair for everyone. Anyway, after doing all of that for about 20 years, um, I was having a think one day and it struck me that still 20 years on, most people didn't understand what I did for work. And when I told them about how I was working at the international level and making laws about this and that, uh, they said, hmm, but Tara, I agree with you. Climate change is a really big problem, but what can I do? What can I do in my life? Um, tell me what, what I can do in my house. What can I do in my garden? And so I decided to take a brave step and to try and write a book uh, that would help everybody to live more sustainably. And I said, how will I do that now that it appeals to everybody, whether they think they're green or not? Um, and I thought, I'll write it about everyday objects. And so I wrote a book about pens and cups of tea and mobile phones and books and computers, all of the things that are right here on my desk, things that we find in everybody's house. Um, and what I did is I wrote a book to try and show what the environmental impact is of all of these things. So I had to read mountains of the most boring papers and research papers and documents you can imagine. But I did that to try and boil down, to try and find the best bits of information and to say those in, write those down in plain English that everybody could understand. They could understand the fact that their mobile phone is made up of precious minerals. Some of those are dug out of the ground in the Congo by, by young boys who have very few rights. A lot of the chemicals and metals that are in here are dangerous if, they, if this phone just becomes e-waste, which is what we call chronic waste. So what I do with this phone when I'm finished with it, how it's recycled, how it's reused, how the pieces of metal inside it are reused to make another phone, that's really, really important for everybody to know. And so that's the kind of thing that I explain in the book. And then I tell people what they can do to live more sustainably around these really everyday objects. Um, and that's what I'd love to talk to you a little bit about today. How it is that any of us, whether we're a school student or a mom or a dad or a teacher, what it is that we can do to be playing our part. The next thing I want to do is show you a little video, which is a little bit, it'll show you a little bit about where I live because some of this next bit is actually filmed in my house. It's just a few seconds um, that really kind of tell you a little bit about why I'm passionate about helping people to live more sustainably. Like, I don't think we will make these changes to save the planet. I think we'll make them because they're good for us. That's why we have to, in some ways as well, unpack this from being something that's just a green agenda to something that's about building a better world for us all. So I hope some of you spotted my dog in there. Did you see, you see him jumping off the trampoline? That's my dog, Bertie. Um, but what's really important in that little snippet is that I really do think that living more sustainably is something that every single person can do. Um, and I think we just have to make it easier for people and explain it better and let people see how powerful they are. So here's a little thing for you to think about. You can use the chat box if you wanted to answer some of these questions. Have you ever eaten a sausage or even a burger off one of these disposable barbecues? Let me know if you have. I'm just going to move down here so I can see what's going on in the chat box too. Um, chat there. So let me know if you have ever eaten a sausage off a disposable barbecue. I imagine a good few of you have. Yeah. Um, and I bet it tasted good too. 
But I tell you what, these disposable barbecues drive me crazy. Francesca, I can't see any of the chat, so you just feel free to jump in if people have really interesting things to say. Um, these disposable barbecues drive me, drive me crazy. They're made out of aluminium, so aluminium is a really precious metal that we have to mine out of the ground. And, and in that process, it actually creates quite a lot of pollution. Um, and then we use that aluminium in this case for once. We just use this disposable barbecue once and then we throw it away. Yet that aluminium is a really precious resource. It's the same metal that drinks can. So if you get a can of Coke or Fanta or 7-Up or something like that, it's the same material that that can is made out of. And that aluminium, it can be recycled over and over and over and over again. It's a really precious resource. So whenever you are treated to a can of Coke or Fanta or 7-Up or whatever it is, do make sure that you empty out, if you leave any, which I doubt you will, make sure that you empty it out and you put it in the recycling bin because that is a really precious resource that we can recycle and make into new things. Unlike the disposable barbecue, which by the time you've used it is covered in bits of greasy sausage and also covered in pieces of charcoal and therefore can't be recycled because it's dirty. But worse still, if you're like me and you spent a lot of your summer on beaches, and um, you'll have seen a lot of these left behind by people on the beach, and that's just a terrible source of litter. So one thing people could do is not use these disposable barbecues. They could either bring a reusable barbecue, um, so one that you can pack away and take out again and again, or if not, maybe just have sandwiches for a change that day instead of sausages. And um, let me see what else I have. This is someone's PlayStation setup. Does anybody here leave their PlayStation plugged in and turned on all the time? I wonder if anybody is a culprit of this. I imagine lots of us are. And it might not be a PlayStation. It might be an iPad. It might be a TV. Um, it could be the computer that you use, um, that you're gaming on, whatever it might be. But every time we leave these things plugged in, they're using electricity. And you might think, oh, well, that's OK. My mum and dad pay the electricity bill. I don't pay the electricity bill. But um, it's not just the fact that it's costing your family money. It's also the fact that the more energy you use in general, uh, the more greenhouse gas emissions you're producing. So as Ireland transitions to more renewable energy, um, luckily we won't have to worry about whether we're burning fossil fuels like oil and gas and coal to make energy. It'll be cleaner energy. But until then, it certainly makes a big difference to use, use less electricity in our homes because less electricity means we put less of the pollution that causes climate change into the atmosphere. So something as simple as not leaving your Xbox le left on all the time is actually a massively important thing that you can do. Hmm, has anybody been lucky enough to go on an aeroplane on their holidays? Um, I have, like I admitted to you, I used to fly a lot for my work over and back to New York and all around the world. I've actually been to all seven continents of the world, even Antarctica. So my carbon footprint from flying is dreadful. Um, and sure, it is great fun to fly back in the days when we could. But I think what we've learned this year is we can actually also have really cool holidays right here in Ireland. Um, I think people are calling them staycations, aren't they? Um, but we don't always have to go in an airplane. And actually, if you calculate your carbon footprint, you can find carbon footprint calculators. A really good one is the World Wildlife Fund's carbon uh, footprint calculator. You'll see that just one, one flight, two flights, three flights a year um, adds a huge amount to your carbon footprint. So cutting that out or reducing it a little bit is a massive thing that you can do. And does anybody's bedroom look a bit like this? Did you know that in the research I did for my book, I discovered that you kids play with only 5% of all the toys you own. So although you probably are lucky enough to have a room full of toys, there's only about 12 of those that you play with with any regularity. And the rest sometimes, and if my son is anything to go by, you forget even some of the other things that you have. And unfortunately, most of those toys are made out of plastic, and most of the plastic that they're made out of is not recyclable. So most toys are made out of different types of plastic, not just one kind. And so we can't put them in the recycling bin. And so those toys end up in landfill or going for incineration. And as I imagine you've learned, 
plastic lasts forever in our atmosphere, hundreds and hundreds of years for it to break down. And even then it just breaks down into tinier and tinier pieces, which wind up in the fish that we eat and the water that we drink. Um, so again, this is something to think about. Sometimes when it's your birthday, maybe ask for an experience, like ask to go away for the day somewhere or to have friends over to do something or make something together rather than maybe always asking for new things because all of those toys, they add up in your room, that's fine. It's lots of clutter to fall over. But remember, you're only going to play with 5% of all that you own. So this is the problem with plastic pollution. And I think, I can't quite remember, I think my next slide is a little story, a little video. Oh yeah, no, this is what I wanted to say, sorry. Um, I wanted to make sure that you all understand that I am not perfect and that you don't need to be perfect. So I don't want this bedroom to become three toys and everything perfectly orderly and tidy. That would be boring. Um, and I don't want any of you to be perfect, but I think we can all be a bit better. And that's all that we're trying to do, be a little bit better in how we live our lives. Um, and if you come to my house, you will find things that are not done correctly. In fact, I have not even done all the things it says to do in my book. Yeah, I promise you I have not done them all. Um, so we're eight Yes, go ahead. Uh, that'll really resonate with everyone because there's a lot of people saying that's exactly like their bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so don't feel bad if it is your bedroom, but maybe, you know, if there's some toys, what could you do with toys that you're not playing with? Maybe if there is some stuff there and you really, you haven't played with it in a year or two, but it's in really good condition. Do you have a cousin you could pass it on to or a neighbor down the road who's a boy or a girl a little bit younger than you and they could play with it? Or... Here we can sometimes take toys to um, community play schools or nurseries and they'll take them or maybe to a charity shop. Um, at the moment, some, some places need that you to put the stuff aside for, you know, 48 hours um, because of COVID, but that's all doable too. But yeah, don't let those toys go to waste. Toys are fun after all. Um, but yeah, I think it's really fun to think about some other things you could ask for for your birthday or Christmas. Um, that, that aren't just a toy too. Try and think of a fantastic experience, something you'd like to do. Maybe a day, a day out and go for lunch with your mum or dad or something. Um, get creative, see and think. Maybe say, oh, well, can we go for a picnic on the beach that day for my birthday? Can we make that a really special thing that we do? Anyway, I'm sure you guys have way better ideas than me. My children say, oh, my ideas are boring. Yeah. One worry thing, Asher has wanted us to say that if a plastic bottle was dropped on the ground and never moved, it would be there for 4,000 years. I think it could be dead right. It would at least be there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We only created plastic back in the 1950s. So we can't actually go back and find a 4,000 year old piece of plastic to test this on. But what we do know is that where they do experiments, where they model and speed up the, regen the degenerative process, so they speed up the sun shining on that bottle and the impact of water and the rain on it and everything it, it does take hundreds and hundreds of years for it to break down so so plastic is fantastic if it's used for things that we use over and over again or things that we need to be really strong like if we want to make a storage container for a toxic chemical then plastic is the best thing in the whole world but making um you know straws out of plastic so we drink a drink with a straw for 10 minutes and then we throw it away that doesn't make sense or coffee cups out of plastic that get used for 10 or 15 minutes and throw it away that doesn't make any sense um okay here's the first little thing to think about this is one for you to think about i want you to all think about your own families i imagine you might be at home now um doing your homework you might be sitting at the kitchen table um has your mom or dad made a cup of tea today who in your house drinks most tea? Uh, it might be your teenage big sister, might be your mum, might be your granny, comes in and always makes a cup of tea. Now I want you to do one thing, the next time they're making a cup of tea, have a look. When they go to fill the kettle, do they fill the kettle up to the top each time, even if they're only making one cup of tea? If they do, do you know what? They're literally pouring pounds and pence down the drain. Um, so every time you boil more water than you need, that's literally energy for nothing. And 85% of the carbon footprint of a cup of tea comes from boiling the water to make it. Not from growing the tea in Kenya and traveling help and transporting it all the way from Kenya to, the, to Belfast to end up on your kitchen table one day. It's actually from just boiling the water to make the tea. 
Do you know what else is surprising that you find in tea bags? It's fact, many of you might know this already, that many, many tea bags contain plastic. So the glue that holds the plastic, the tea bag together can be made of plastic or actually sometimes even the, the mesh that the plastic, uh, that the tea bag is made of is made of plastic. And what that means is they also don't biodegrade. So lots of people put them in their compost bins hoping that they'll break down and they go out and check two years later in their garden and the tea bag is still sitting there and that's because they're made of plastic. If you look around now, you'll see lots of campaigns around that are trying to get the companies to make plastic free tea bags. And what you can do in the meantime, if you can't buy plastic free tea bags, you could suggest this to your mum or dad or whoever is the big tea drinker in your house, is you could go back to making uh, tea in a pot with tea leaves because everybody says, and I think it's true, uh, that that tea tastes nicer. So if your mum or dad thinks they're a real tea connoisseur, or even if you are, I know loads of kids that love tea, milky tea, um, try and see and try and make it if you can with tea leaves instead. And those tea leaves you can put straight into your compost bin in your garden or into your food waste bin and they will rot down no problem at all and can be turned into compost to grow new plants in. So we're going to think a little bit more about plastic. So we were just been talking about how plastic you know, lasts in the environment and how dangerous it is. So I want to show you this little video which is all around the issue of plastic in our oceans. It's a bit sad, isn't it? I think it's sad. Um, but then there's lots that we can do to avoid those sad things in that film happening. Um, all of these things that are made out of plastic are all things that we human beings have created. 
and we've invented them. Even just those hoops that hold cans of drinks together, um, or we've designed the best fishing nets, and we've designed them all to be made out of plastic, so they're really strong and they last forever. But the fact that we design them means that we're also going to be able to design alternatives to them, and we're going to be able to use our really clever brains as human beings to think about alternatives, so that we're not harming the other creatures that are living on Earth. And if that video, if you thought that was sad, one thing you can do at the weekend, and nowadays you'll need to be careful and you'll need to wear gloves when you're doing this and wash your hands really carefully when you go home. Um, but you can help out with a beach clean and help to tidy up uh, our beaches and make sure that all of these bits of plastic that get washed up or get left behind by people when they go to the beach, that they don't end up in our, in our rivers, in our streams and in our oceans so that we can keep those and creatures safer. But even better than that is to not use these things in the first place. So can we together think of some plastic free alternatives? Let's see, what could we use? You saw what happened there when the balloon got let go by the little girl and it floated off into the sky and it popped and it ended up in the ocean. And in the ocean, that balloon looked just like a jellyfish and had turtles love to eat jellyfish. And so that turtle ate the balloon by mistake and it went into its tummy and it would make it feel not well and then maybe not make it want to eat properly. And then that can cause the turtle to die, which is really sad. So if you have a birthday coming up, what could you use instead of balloons to make the house feel festive and nice? Can anybody give me an idea for what you could use instead of a balloon? Um, can be great to have some of those shouted out because for some reason, Francesca, I can see the Q&A, but I can't see the chat. I can oh, tell that was you, so I'm... sad. I can see them now. I yes. know it was sad, wasn't well, it? There is somebody actually that is saying confetti. So if you want to add a little note there, Tara. <laughs> I see that confetti now. Again, it depends what confetti is made of. What about throwing rice instead of confetti? Would that help? Um, confetti, yes, if you made it out of uh, if you made it out of reusing paper that had been something else, you could make some confetti for you to play with in your house. I wouldn't do it outside because it would cause litter, but in your house that you could hoover up again, maybe out of all magazines. I use lights so they could be used year um, next year again. Uh, Pull kit says that that's a good idea. Flowers, Olivia, how beautiful would that be? Paper chains, so much nicer. Really, really good ideas. Um, I have some friends who've also made like bunting out of out of um, out of paper, but also out of material from old clothes. You can get really, really, really creative. Um, but yeah, just think how beautiful paper lamps. All of these things are good good ideas. The only thing I will say about those paper Chinese lamps is you need to be careful with those. They actually cause as much damage in the environment and to wildlife as balloons do. Um, there's some instances of poor cows eating them by mistake and it doesn't go well. So here's another one for you. What could we use as a plastic free alternative to wrapping paper and the bags, the gift bags and things like that? So a lot of wrapping paper, if it's shiny or has sparkles on it or anything like that, is generally made from plastic. So one thing you can do is choose the plainest paper you can find because that then at least will be recyclable. Um, the gift bags often have plastic handles or other plastic things on the front of them. Same with ribbon, most of it's made out of plastic. Any ideas for things you could use to wrap up presents instead of these kind of things? Has anybody got any suggestions? Somebody saying I can, brown paper. Paper. I can see them now. Sorry, Francesca, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you want. Uh, flower chains, use a jute product. Surrender, that is a very, Surrender Kumar, that's a very uh, good idea if you can find a jute bag. So jute is a biodegradable product. My friend wraps family gifts in special blankets. Oh, that's nice. Reuse magazine papers, great idea. Add flowers instead of a gift tag, I love it. Those are great ideas. And you can make your, your parcel look like a work of art. Um, Asher has a question there about the chat, Francesca, that I leave to you. Okay, what are the next things I want you to think of plastic-free alternatives to? Does anybody bring their lunch to school in a plastic sealable bag, like one of these, one of these sandwich bags? What could you use instead of one of these bags? Because they create quite a lot of plastic waste too. If you do use them, one thing I would say is rinse them out and reuse them. Certainly don't use them once and throw them in the bin. Um, has anybody got any suggestions for what you might do um, with some of these plastic bags, if you have them. 
Oh, I'm going, I'm going to try and find the chat again. One person, Paris, and beeswax. Beeswax, yeah, yeah. for bees wraps, that's a great idea. Yeah, thanks, Francesca. It just, sometimes it's coming up and sometimes it's not for some reason. Can you see it now, Tara? Or no, I can't now. Somebody's Amazing. saying metal box. You know, I'm hitting on it. It just doesn't show up. Right. Well, we can tell you there is somebody oh, and suggesting. And then there it just appeared. So, yeah, right. I don't know. Somebody's yeah. suggesting metal box. Others are saying paper bags. Yeah, biodegradable leaves. bags. That's what Leah some, does. Yeah. Some people Again, are saying leaves. Yeah. Do, try not to use the bags only once. Um, you know, you can reuse some of those. Why not just a lunchbox? If it's some fruit or nuts or a, a sandwich, it can just go in a lunchbox. It doesn't have to be wrapped in anything. Um, you're right, dead right. Uh, Akriti Roy, you can use certain leaves for packing food. You could. If we had banana trees growing in our gardens, they would be great. Unfortunately, they don't grow so well here. Um, but... Um, a lunchbox, whether it's metal, even if it's plastic, at least you will reuse it and reuse it and reuse it. All of those things are better than using um, single-use bags. Okay, uh, another one for you. Wipes. Wipes are, wipes feel nice, they're good for cleaning your face with and your hands, but did you know that wipes are made out of plastic? Um, and the worst thing you can do with a wipe is flush it down the toilet because flush down the toilet, they cause major blockages in sewers and it costs an absolute fortune. They cause things, they build up with the grease that people um, wash down the sink and they call as cause a thing called a fatberg, which is pretty disgusting and blocks up the whole sewage system. It's done that in London City and caused a massive problem. So what could you use instead of a wet wipe? Any ideas? And I'll try and see if I can see this again. Any idea? One said face cloth. Face cloth, yes, an old fashioned face cloth. You can use that again and again, and when it's dirty, just put it in the wash. What else, Francesca? Somebody's just saying soap and water, which is actually something we forget about. And the great thing about soap and water is soap and water kills the coronavirus. So it's the best thing. If you have soap and water, you do not need anything else. I know that isn't always practical if you're out and about, and that's why we now have to carry the little things of sanitizer. But even with the little things of sanitizer, think about how you can refill those so you don't have to buy a new one each time. So buy the biggest container you can find, and then hold on to the little container you have and just refill it. Yeah, somebody also started saying sponge, but then sometimes sponges can be... Believe it or not, a lot of sponges are made out of plastic. So those yellow and green sponges that most of us have at the sink for washing the dishes, they are made out of plastic. They don't biodegrade. And here is a disgusting fact for you that I know you'll remember. They contain more bacteria than your toilet. Mm -hmm. That's kind of disgusting, isn't it? it is. So uh, yeah, sponges are not always the answer either, especially the plastic ones. Tara, someone has said, what about the flushable toilet wipes? Are they okay? Would you like to comment on The that? latest research on those is that they're not really flushable. The best thing to do is not flush anything down your toilet that isn't pee or poo or toilet paper. Um, and the people that work on looking after our sewage and water systems are pretty clear on that. Um, even the ones that say flushable, no thank you. And most of the flushable ones, unfortunately, still do contain plastic. Um, so if you can avoid them, that is a massive step, um, a massive reduction in the waste that you'll create. Does anybody here like making slime? Uh, my children, if I let them, would make slime nonstop. What's the main ingredient that you have to put in first to make slime? It's white PVA glue. And the PVA is the, is the, is the clue there. It's actually plastic. So when you make slime using PVA glue, you are, you, you're just making plastic slime. Um, and that slime, if it washes down the sink while you're making it, or if you throw away, throw it away after a while because it goes a bit hard or smelly on you, um, then it's also not going to biodegrade or disappear. So if you do want to make slime over the weekend, Google for plastic-free slime recipes made out of um, things like, um, oh, the word's gone out of my head, corn flour, sorry, and water and food dye. And you can still make slime and it still feels really cool, I promise you but it doesn't have loads of plastic in it. So that's another one for you to think about when you're looking for plastic-free alternatives. Okay, here's a few more things you can do. I don't want to talk for too much longer because I want to hear your questions too. 
Um, do you help with the laundry? I hope so. Um, do you help tidy your room? I hope so. But here's something that, to think about. The next time your mum or dad says, go tidy your room and you go up and you take everything off the floor and just stick it in the laundry basket without checking whether it's clean or dirty, is that could be really adding to the carbon footprint of your clothes. So with, if I'm wearing a pair of jeans at the moment, 37% of the carbon footprint of my jeans comes from how much I wash them and dry them. So if we can wash our clothes less, it makes a massive difference to the carbon footprint of all of the clothes that we wear. Um, so try, they say you should wear your jeans, if you haven't spilled anything really nasty on them, you should try and wear your jeans 10 times before you wash them, okay? So on top of helping with the laundry, try and separate it out. So you're only putting things into the wash that actually need to be washed. And then maybe you could help with hanging the clothes out on the line so they don't have to go in the tumble dryer, because tumble dryers use lots and lots of energy too. Have you ever thought about what's in your clothes? Um, if you look at your clothes, see how many things are made out of cotton, how many are made out of polyester, acrylic. A lot of our clothes are made from synthetics, so they're actually plastic clothes. So if you have a fleece, it's definitely made from polyester, it's synthetic. Any, kind, any of your running clothes, your gym gear, and the clothes you wear for sports, GAA, anything like that, all, nearly all of those clothes are made out of some kind of plastic fibre. And when we wash those clothes in the washing machines, little tiny fibres get washed off and they go out through the washing machine, out through the filter because they're so small and into our waterways. And those little fibres are just small enough that if you remember from the video I showed, they can get eaten by prawns and fish and other wildlife and they can end up then back in our food. They have found on experiments now that in everything from water to your dad's beer, fish, to vegetables, there are microfibers in them now. And one of the key ways they come is from our clothes. So again, if you wash your clothes less, that's a good thing. Um, and when you're shopping, try and look for clothes made from cotton and wool and natural fibers rather than synthetics. And if you do need something like a new fleece, try and find a fleece that's made from recycled plastic. So believe it or not, your old um, bottle, if you had a bottle, a plastic bottle of Coke, that can be turned into a fleece jacket. So look for then, if you're buying synthetic clothes, look for the ones that are made from something recycled. Another thing you could look at when you're at home is, is your house full of chemicals? If you look under the sink in the kitchen or in the utility room, are there stacks and stacks of bottles of cleaning stuff? Every single one of those is probably A, in a plastic bottle or an aluminium spray container, and they're full of chemicals that aren't actually very good for our health. And if you want a challenge for the weekend, what I'd like you to do is Google how to make your own spray cleaner. All you need is vinegar and bread soda and something that smells like, like it's nice, like lavender essence. Sorry, something that smells nice, like, you know, lavender oil, essence oil of, of lavender. And that's all you need to make your own spray cleaner. And you can use that one spray cleaner to clean the bathroom, the kitchen, everything. So the next time you're helping with the, with the housework, that's something you could try. But maybe your mum or dad would let you try and make your own cleaner. As we talked about at the beginning, don't forget to turn things off. The TV, the computer, everything. Vampire energy is what we call the energy that gets used when um, appliances are left on standby. standby. And in Europe, 11% of all the energy used by European houses um, is, comes down to leaving things on standby. So in your house, it's probably much the same. 11% extra onto the bill that you're paying because you're leaving things on standby. And here's a little thing you could do. You could try and do an energy audit this weekend. Go around the house and write a list of all the appliances that you can find that are left on standby. The TV, the printer, the computer, the microwave, the radio, whatever it might be, count them up, see how many you get, and then see if by next weekend you can reduce that number by three. Everything that you do there will save your family money, but also reduce the amount of pollution that your family causes that contributes to climate change. Okay, that's one thing you could do. Other things to think about, who is it in your house that goes, oh, I'm cold and goes and turns up the heat? Every time you turn up the heat in your house by just one degree, it adds 10% onto the bill. So try, try and keep it cooler and maybe put on a jumper instead of saying you're cold and would mum or dad turn up the heat might be a good thing. And I don't know how many of you have thought about uh, open fires and stoves. 
maybe they make you feel nice and cozy and you think oh it's so nice when I come home from school or on the weekend when we light the fire to keep warm um, and of course we all like to keep warm but open fires and even even wood burning stoves they produce as much air pollution um, or as wood burning stove does as much air pollution as a car a diesel car does as 18 diesel cars do so 18 diesel cars driving along for an hour is the same amount of um, uh, pollution produced by a wood burning stove. And what we know now is that in Ireland last year, 13,000 people died from air pollution. And the key causes of air pollution in Ireland are, um, ha are solid fuels, so burning turf and coal and, <clears throat> and wood in our homes. Um, and also driving diesel cars. Those are the two main causes of air pollution and it's killing loads of people. Um, so we, everything we can do to try and um, burn less fossil fuels, in this case, less coal and less peat in our fires, the better it would be. Give you a few more things to think about. In your garden, loads of things you could do. <clears throat> if you can persuade your family just to not mow all of the lawn, but make, let maybe let a little bit go wild, then that can be a really nice place for biodiversity, for bugs and beetles and butterflies to come and live. You could even build one of these bug hotels that I'm sure you guys have learned about in school. <coughs> and another really important thing that we can all do for gardening, and I think lots of us did lots of gardening during uh, lockdown, is to try to make sure that when we're growing new things and growing seedlings, that we do use compost to grow them in that has no peat in them. If it's compost made of peat, which most compost is, then that means that we've had to dig up a bog um, to make that compost. And bogs hold more carbon than, than the Amazon rainforest. They are amazing places for holding carbon and they're amazing places for biodiversity. They have plants that eat animals. They have newts living in them. They are amazing. So we need to hang on to our bogs. So look at the bag the next time you're out in the shed and see if it says, that your compost contains peat or not and maybe the next time go with your mum or dad to the garden center and give them a little reminder who has a dog so i have a dog now he's one year old his name is bertie and of course i have to pick up his poo after him but would i ever put the poo in a poo bag and hang it on a tree i hope not but i'm sure that's something you've all seen <clears throat> and the, the problem there is that the poo in itself is would biodegrade and wouldn't last for hundreds of years but by the time you put it in a poo bag and now it will last for hundreds of years so one thing you could do is to get a dog waste only composter bin in your garden so you can put your dog waste in with your food waste but you can create um, a separate hole in the ground a deep hole in the ground in your garden if you wanted to and you can put your dog poo in there without any plastic bags and it will rot down no problem um, but one or another, anyway, do not leave them hanging in trees because I think we all agree that's a disaster. So I wanted to leave you with one more challenge that you might think about doing. Um, this one's really fun. You have to run around and pick up all the trainers in your house, every single smelly pair, line them up and count how many pairs there are in your house. And houses have a lot of pairs of trainers if you have lots of brothers and sisters. Um, so count how many pairs you have and then you're going to work out the carbon footprint of your trainers. So one pair of trainers has the carbon footprint equal to 14 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So you can then multiply two pairs by 14, three pairs by 14 to see how many um, kilograms of carbon the trainers alone in your house are responsible for. And if you want to work out what that means in something else maybe easier to relate to, one pair of shoes equals 55 kilometers driven in a car. So see how far your, collect, your pairs of trainers in your house would get your family. So if one pair is 55 kilometers and you find 12 pairs, how many kilometers would that be? Where would you be able to get to? Maybe you'd get down here to Kinsale to visit me. Okay, I'll, I'll share these um, challenges um, with Francesca so she can send them out to you all later. And last thing is think about Halloween. It's the next big um, party coming up. I know we're all a bit worried about whether we'll be able to go trick or treating or not. And will people be able to give out sweets or not? I know it is of great concern to my 10 year old child, whether it will go ahead. But another thing that is commonly done at Halloween is we buy lots and lots of costumes. They're all made out of plastic. So they're all made out of synthetic fibers. And um, we tend to wear them once and throw them away. So a few suggestions are either make your own costumes or look for some in secondhand shops or um, 
make your own, look for some in secondhand shops, pass on any old ones you have that don't fit you anymore to somebody else and get a little bit creative. You can make wonderful things. Um, but that's a lot of, lot of things that we throw away around Halloween and the most of them are made from plastic. So that's just the next holiday coming up, something to think about. So listen, you can ask me anything you want to know. I have researched for the book objects in the bedroom, the bathroom, for parties and celebrations, things that you use in the office, in a school, sports gear, leisure gear, anything at all. Um, I'd love to answer your questions, any of them that you might have. And what I'd love you to, uh, oh, I'm going to come back to that. What I'd love you to remember is that when you do ask questions about things, when you are curious, and then when you take an action, and then when you tell somebody the action that you've taken, it causes this massive ripple effect and you become so powerful. So every single little thing you do is important. Before I came on, I made my plastic promise. Um, it is to be a plastic free ambassador and to help children in Ireland to be plastic free ambassadors. Um, so while you have a program for this in Northern Ireland, I work on one here in the, in the Republic called Plastic Free for Kids. So that's my promise. Um, and I'd love to hear about what your plastic promise is. Um, we hope we will have time to hear from some of those as well in the Q&A. So thank you for listening to me. Um, if you want more ideas or if you want to buy a present for somebody in your family, that's the name of my book, How to Save Your Planet One Object at a Time. Um, and it's been really nice interacting with you all and I can't wait for your questions. Great, thanks very much Tara, that was brilliant. We've got a few questions here, so I'll just kick it off. James has asked, is there such a thing as biodegradable plastic? This is a really, really good question. So any plastic that's made from hydrocarbon, so it's made from oil dug out of the ground, is never going to be biodegradable. Um, people are making uh, plastics or things that function like a plastic now out of plants. Um, so you can buy cornstarch film, for example, that might be wrapped around a newspaper or a magazine that looks like plastic, but is actually compostable. But ideally, what you want to look for is things that are biodegradable doesn't tell us a whole lot. Um, it just tells it that it breaks down over time. What you really want to know is that you can find new types of plastic alternatives which are compostable. Compostable means that at the end of its life, it can be turned back into essentially soil and used again. So look for compostable uh, alternatives to like plastic film and plastic bags. Those are the best way to go. I have a comment that is very strange. I have read through the chat and there is also a question from the same person here. Alisa is asking about plastic straws and she was making comments about the fact that if you cut them very, in very small pieces, they are not gonna be any harmful for fish and wildlife, marine wildlife. Can you add please some? Yeah. yeah, no, so I'm afraid they would still be really dangerous for marine life, even if cut up small. Um, you, maybe you're thinking about, there was a, a video ye a few years ago that broke my heart of a, of a turtle with a straw stuck in its nose. Um, and that was quite a big piece of straw. Maybe you think that's why it must be that long to be dangerous. But no, in small pieces, that bit of plastic straw will look like food. Um, to a marine animal and they will eat it. And those small pieces of plastic, even if they weren't eaten immediately, they will break down through the action of the ocean or being, being left in a ditch and they'll break down into smaller and smaller plastics. And then whether it's a pygmy shrew or a fish, they will get, they will get eaten. And um, if any of those things are things that humans eat, then they will end up also back inside us. And we don't know what the plastic inside us is doing. We haven't understood that yet. Um, I love turtles, Asher, so do I, yeah, so if you love turtles, say no to straws, you don't need a straw, if you do buy yourself a metal one that you can wash and clean in the dishwasher, bring it with you if you're going out, um, much better, and more and more cafes and restaurants now have either uh, got no straws, or maybe they might give you a nice metal straw, or they have paper straws, all of those are better, but really we can live life in most cases, unless we have a disability, or we're very old or something that we need it for a medical purpose, most of us can live without a straw. Tara, the next one, very current, so how is sustainability possible during the pandemic, if we're afraid of catching the virus with everything we use? So this is a really good question. I would say the one thing to remember about this virus, there's loads we don't know about this virus, and I'm not a medical person, but what we do know is that soap and water kills this virus, okay? So that means that a lot of the things that we're worried about, if we just wash them, we're safe. 
So I watched, I don't know if any of you watched The War on Plastic on BBC uh, a few weeks ago, but they had a professor on who was explaining how the virus could live so much longer on the bag around, the plastic bag around a bag of carrots rather than actually on the carrots. So you were just as safe to buy carrots loose in your supermarket and bring them home and wash them as usual before you use them. In fact, putting them in the plastic bag actually gave the, the virus a greater chance of making it into your home. So um, we just have to be a bit more careful, like in every part of life at the moment. So you can still do a beach clean. You just need to wear gloves and wash your hands really carefully afterwards. Um, we can still swap things and share things. We maybe just need to sanitize them before we share them or leave them aside for 48 hours, 72 hours, if we want to be absolutely sure before we give them to somebody else. But all of that is possible. Um, um, what else have we got, Claire? Tara, here's another one from Belle, who's nine. She's from Stra Straban Primary School, and she's asked, do you think using bamboo containers is good for the environment? Um, I think using any container over and over and over and over and over again is better for the environment. So whether your container is bamboo or steel, or even if it's a plastic lunchbox, as long as you get loads and loads of use out of it, that's the main thing to do. Um, the advantage of bamboo over plastic is bamboo is compostable, um, whereas plastic isn't. But some of those plastic containers can be recycled um, at the end of their life, but you just need to check. There is um, a comment that actually got my attention as well and was uh, about the, um, well, the use of like reducing coal and peat in our fireplace. Mm -hmm. And somebody was saying, well, my mom feels very cold. So mm -hmm. if you have any suggestion or tips. Yeah, of course. Or so this is really important. If your fire is your only source of heat in your house, then you have to use it if you don't have anything else. Yeah, so you have to be warm. It's dangerous to get too cold and get colds and things like that. Um, but if you have alternatives, so if you could leave the radiators on a half an hour longer instead of the fire, that would be better for your health. Because when we burn coal and peat, it releases pollutants, not just outside into the atmosphere, but also inside into our house. And that affects our lungs and our health. So especially if you have asthma or anything like that, it really isn't very, very good for, good for you. But if it's your only source of heat, then you have to use it. That's, a, that's fine. And I, remember, it's not perfect. It's better. So only change the things you can change. Tara, what about you? When you started reducing your plastic, is there one thing that you thought, oh my goodness, I didn't realise I used so much of that and you reduced it or you swapped it out or you completely banned it and you felt really like, wow, that's made an incredible difference to reducing your plastic waste and maybe giving you joy for <laughs> just not using a different item or is there one thing that really sticks out in your head? I don't know if there's one thing, but I do know that uh, when we ran out of cling film in at certain points in time and I said I'm not buying it again and my husband said we won't be able to live without cling film and I said I think we will if it's just not there and I had bamboo wraps and um, I had loads of containers so I don't even buy like Tupperware containers I just reuse things because no matter it's really really hard to avoid everything so if you buy ice cream which I have to do because I'm a mother of two children and it comes in a plastic container, then I just keep that container and I use it as a lunchbox. Yeah? So uh, a proud thing is the fact that since I didn't buy any more cling film, it has not in any way been the end of the world. And there are so many alternatives. Sometimes you just need to not have it in your house and then you can find an alternative. And my husband hasn't divorced me, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Tara, I have a question actually, because at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that for, uh, I don't know how many years, you were a policy advisor. Mm -hmm. So we have very uh, young activists here in uh, Northern Ireland. So what would you recommend or suggest um, for them to reach uh, politicians, MLAs, MPs, and how they can make their voice heard and try to have an impact on policy making. Mm. So anything you can do, like I know it sounds uh, maybe not so exciting, but writing to them is really important. Saying to them that, for example, if you've done a project in your school around any element of environment and you want them to change something, write to them. I'll give you an example. In my kids' school, they, the school milk comes with a plastic straw. And so they have written, they wrote to one of Ireland's biggest dairies over and over again as a collective. I think it took five or six letters. And in this, they had to correct 
the, the big company who told them to just push the straw into the carton and put it in the recycling, which was like, oh, you can't do that. They had to write to them. They had to correct them. They made them a promise, which they broke. So they had to write to them again. But that nonstop pressure, even on those big companies, makes a big difference. So whether it's a big company or it's your elected representative, um, using using your voice, writing as a collective of school children, um, writing on your own with a group that you're involved in, um, really does have an impact. That and use your and use your voice. You know whether it's your play GAA and you've decided you're never going to have a plastic, a single use plastic water bottle again. You're always going to bring your own reusable water bottle. Tell your friends. Um, make it so that at matches and everything, everybody brings their own water bottle. Let that be the thing that you change. But when you change one thing, and then if you get the rest of your team, and that's fifteen or twenty people to change two, that's a, that's amazing what you will have achieved by then. And then you can be, you will be a plastic free ambassador. I truly believe it. An ambassador is just some, someone who goes and speaks up for something that needs to be said. And in this case, you're speaking up for the change we need to make. Um, to to stop the use of pointless plastics, isn't that what you call them, Claire? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a great note to end on, Tara. We've ran out of time, but we had that was really enjoyable. I hope a lot of people got really found some really great ideas from that, and are definitely going to take eco action in all of the ways that you said, and also do their public commitments by adding their plastic promise. So thank you so much for being with us here today. And thanks to all everyone, the participants that have joined us. And that was great. So thank you very much. Please look out for our, at our Eco Schools NI Facebook page, where you'll see our future webinars that are coming up there and you can register. So yeah, great. Thanks very much for everybody joining us. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks.